Welcome to episode 99 of Sharing Life Lessons. This is season 10. We are one spirit, one soul, one world. And together we are creating a library of stories and life lessons. I am your host Hamida and I want to bring you stories. Because stories matter, stories inspire, stories teach and stories heal. Episode number 99. 99 listeners, that is one less than 100. This is music to my ears. I can't wait to celebrate my next episode with all of you, each one of you. Let me share a fun fact with you about my listener statistics. Until the eighth season, Sharing Life Lessons was heard in 28 countries by 63% women and 32% men. Then things started to shift, and today, Sharing Life Lessons has over 75,000 listens in 32 countries by 70% men and 30% women. That is a major shift. I am indifferent about the shift, but I must confess that I was surprised with it. I will not analyze what, why, or how, because to me, a listener is a listener, no matter who you are, which is why I said it is a fun fact. The goal for Sharing Life Lessons is to share and spread knowledge to whoever will listen. So, welcome again to episode number 99. I want to begin this episode by reading a passage from Return to Love, authored by Marianne Williamson. Please listen and hold on to every word in this passage. I have heard it many times, and every time I hear it, I feel the fire in my energy. This passage was made famous by Nelson Mandela, who used it in his inauguration speech. Marianne says, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. This is a powerful passage, and I want to reread one line from here. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. Let us pledge never to undermine ourselves. Especially, let's not make ourselves feel or appear smaller to please others. And as we rise... Let's also pledge to bring others along with us. Today's episode is special because of who the guest is for today. She was the guest for episode number one of Sharing Life Lessons, and I am delighted that she is back with us for number 99. Before she retired, she was the global head of diversity and inclusion for J.P. Morgan Chase. She is a smart, kind, giving, fun person, and a very dear friend. Everyone, please welcome Pat David. Pat, welcome to Sharing Life Lessons. It is wonderful to have you on the show again. To remind the listeners, Pat was guest number one on Sharing Life Lessons. She got me started. She walked into my house with her own mic. I didn't have a mic at that time. I didn't even know I needed a mic. She walked in with her mic and said, let's do this. And we did episode number one, which was on my birthday in 2019. So that was her birthday present to me. Pat, welcome again. Amita, you know, I love you. I've loved you from the moment I met you. I don't even know how many years ago, but I do remember walking into your house with that microphone and I had no other hopes then. Okay, if she can get, if she can do one, maybe she could do two. And it was just so much fun to start you on this journey and look how far you've come. So I'm happy to be part of it. And I'm forever grateful for that. I'm going to be releasing my 95th episode in the 10th season today. Sharing Life Lessons has come a long way. Wonderful. Pat, put you on the spotlight and let you introduce yourself and tell the listeners who you are so they can connect with you. 
So again, thank you, everyone. My name is Patricia David. I'll start by giving you a little bit about my background in terms of my family, my life, and then where I am today. In terms of my background, in terms of life, I was born in Birmingham, England, and because my parents hail from an island in the Caribbean, it's called Dominica, which is a very small island and it's between Antigua and Martinique. When I came to this country, the whole purpose for my parents was so we don't have to share shoes, as they say. The whole goal was to get an education, make something of yourself, and enjoy the benefits of the United States of America. And so that's what I keep in the back of my head anytime I do something to make sure that my parents' sacrifice was duly paid. Roll the clock forward, I got a degree at Fordham University in the Bronx. I was fortunate enough to get a job right out of college. My degree was in finance and economics with a minor in accounting. All the while, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I didn't have anybody in my circle of family to tell me how to be a lawyer. And you think that I would have been a lawyer because I went to a college that had a law school, but you don't know what you don't know. I spent 10 years at Philip Morris doing very well in finance and accounting. And through a lot of luck, hard work and prayer, I ended up with a nice job at Merrill Lynch in the technology department. Did that for 10 years. Through another episode of my life, I was able to get another job at Solomon which grew into Smith Barney, which grew into Citigroup. And this was all, you go into work every day, you do your job, you keep your nose clean, as my mother would tell me. And you kind of, you're on the lazy Susan of life, so to speak. While I was at Citigroup, that's when I got my first introduction into the world of diversity. I'm 50, no, that's not true, I'm 61. <laughs> I wanted to say 50, but I'll say 61. You know, I would have corrected you because I was there for your 60th birthday. <laughs> you were, you were, you were. I'm holding on to 61 for a while. When I worked in technology, for those of you who were in technology, this was back many years ago, you know, you have your beeper going off, you have your Blackberry going off, things don't work well. It's part of the technology infrastructure. Things break and you have to be literally available 24-7, especially working for a global company. But I remember my boss said to me, it was January of 2001, I believe, and we were going through my performance review and he actually said to me, so you've been here 10 years at the time. I was his chief of staff. And he said, what else do you want to do? And I thought to myself, wow, no one's ever asked me that question. I, at the time in my life, like maybe a lot of the listeners, you don't think about what your next job is. You want to just do good in your current job. And so when he said that, I thought to myself, huh, okay, I've got a few seconds to answer the question. And I really didn't think about it. I said, I want to be the head of diversity. I'd like to be the head of communications or the head of any function where I could do 80% of my work to impact people versus only 20%. Because the job that I had, I was lines of code, I was with vendors, I would with budgets. I didn't really interact with people as much. And I tell you, quite frankly, the diversity head at the time always looked happy. And I thought, boy, if I can do what she's got, I'll take that job because it looks like it's fun. I had no idea what the woman did, but I just thought it would be fun. We go back to our desks. And I didn't think anything of that conversation. Three months to the day, the head of HR tells the firm, the head of diversity has resigned and there's this job open. So my boss, who I had what I thought was a private conversation with, mm -hmm. tells the head of HR, how about Pat David? So his first response was, isn't she a techie? Because that's, you know, the brand. He knew me as the brand of a technology support person, oddly enough, for human resources. So I made sure that he had the right compensation systems and benefit systems and all that stuff. So I get a call from the head of HR. He asked me if I'm interested. And I said, well, I didn't think you knew because it was a secret of conversation that I had with my boss. So I was pretty surprised. And I turned the job down three times because there was no clarity in terms of what the role was. So roll the clock forward. I ended up taking the job. I did very well on the job. And through that relationship in that job, that same boss that I now work for as the head of diversity goes to JP Morgan Chase. I end up working for him five years later as the head of diversity for the whole company at J.P. Morgan Chase. Did that for nine years or whatever it was. And I think I did the job fairly well. It wasn't about me. It was about the people, all the people in the company. But through what I would call life, I had some bad things happen to my family. My sister had passed away, which was not something we expected. And that kind of gave me pause in my life. My husband had a severe heart attack and had to have surgery. And I thought, oh, that's, that's not good. And then my father was very, very sick. My mother had passed away many years before. And so I thought to myself, I have one less sister. My husband is, um, his health was failing. The good news is he's okay now. And my father's health was failing. And I lived in America and he didn't. My job was in the way. So I actually quit. When I quit, I got home and I told my husband, oh, honey, I quit today. He said, what'd you do that for? And I thought, don't you want me to be home? I thought he, he was happy. He's like, no, no, no. And I thought, crap, I just quit. So I had to unquit. That's not easy to do. 
I had to call my boss and I said, you know, that thing I just told you, I, can I have a redo? Can I have a do over? He goes, yes. And I can we forget that ever happened? I'm telling you, it is mind boggling for me that that whole thing was surreal. Now, the good news is my boss at the time didn't tell anybody. So he didn't have to unravel the mm -hmm. fact that I quit, unquit. I was a senior person. You don't do this, right? So what that told me was, look, I can't do this job effectively anymore because I needed to be home. I needed to be available for my family. I needed to take care of things that you can't put off anymore. So when I did resign, I decided to write this book only because people had been bugging me whenever I'd coached them and spoken at different conferences. Hey, you should write a book. And I'm like, okay, I'll write a book. But what I really was doing is all my notes, all my speeches, I said, let me try to collect them in some sort of a thoughtful way. Put them in a book, meaning a Word document, ask someone to make it look pretty and get it out of the market so people can stop asking me to create this book, which is what I did. I had no idea that people were going to think it was interesting. I had no intention of making it anything other than getting off my to-do list. And since that book has been written, other people have been my advocates. Hey, I see you wrote a book. Would you mind coming to the company and do book signing? Okay. So I go do the book signing. I talk about things in the book. And the next thing I know, hey, can you come speak to our senior leaders? And so this is just a very interesting experience for me. And it, you learn a lot when you do these things, but then I'm still making sure that my time is mine. I am not going into a full-time engagement with the company. Mm -hmm. I am not going into a full-time scenario. My time is still very, very important. Time is very precious. I refuse to give it up. I refuse to give it up. Pat, in your introduction, also, we are beginning to learn life lessons. Time is precious. And for the listeners in this entire story that you heard from Pat, well, your host, Tamida, enters in her life at Citigroup. She was the head of DNI in Citigroup. I was the senior credit officer there. She was my mentor, not only my mentor, she then became my friend. And then we were carpool mates, <laughs> yes. which, which we can write a book about also. We used to always say that we have to write a book about, you know, that, that guy that does the carpool on TV where they sing? We had stories of how women can raise each other up, how we can help each other with our spouses and our children and what to cook for dinner and how to be in two places at once. We really did. Five years, we commuted. There were six of us. Mm -hmm. And we all had different day jobs. We all had different lives. But somehow we made those hours match, which was not easy. And there were moments when we wanted to kick someone out the car, leave them behind at the last minute. But it was a memory that we'll never forget. I and not only did we make the hours match, but we made the hours fun when we it were together. Fun. And at times, I woke up in the morning not because I wanted to go to work, but because I wanted to <laughs> ride with these five crazy women to work. In the carpool. That was, that was a joyful time. That was a really good memory. Really good memory. So, Pat, tell us your story. I'm going to tell you the one about my husband. When I was really heavy duty in my career, my husband was a Marine. We got married after I graduated. So he was not a corporate environment kind of person. He was starting to get his degree in heating and ventilation. And when we got married... One of the things that I didn't do that I regret now is you never know how far you're going to go in your career. So I never sat down with him and said, hey, just in case I become really important and I have to travel, are you going to be okay with that? You know, just in case my job has to come first and you don't come, are you going to, you know, you, never, you don't know. So you don't have these conversations. Sure. And so there were moments where it was not a fun time to come home. And I realized I never put him first. Well, I didn't explain to him that on this day, I cannot put you first because he was not part of the corporate environment. So he didn't appreciate the politics you have to go through. Just the way you have to work in these industries. We enjoyed the financial income and the output of that, but at what cost, right? Yep. At what cost? And so that's why when he had the heart attack, my husband probably could have died if I wasn't home that day. And the only reason I was home the day he had the heart attack, it was President's Day. We were off that day. Mm -hmm. That was a Monday. I would have literally, on that day, left my house at 5, got him at 6.15. I happened to be home when this thing was unfolding. And he didn't know it was heart attack. Unless you've had one, you don't know what it feels like. The next thing I know, he's walking around. I'm looking at him. Are you okay? Yeah, not really. So I said, okay, let's go in the car. We drove to the hospital. Thank God the hospital near me is a heart hospital. Mm -hmm. And the day before, my husband was as healthy as an ox. He was the picture of health. There was no signs of anything. We get to the hospital. He's sitting there waiting patiently. He's not complaining. And I said to the lady, I said, oh, my husband had these issues. She said, let's take him in. They put all the gear on him. The doctor comes to see him. 24 hours later, they tell us he had a heart attack. And 
The reason why we didn't know it was a heart attack, he thought it was indigestion because it was at the lower part of the heart, which is the top part of the stomach. They said they were going to do a, a stent. The doctor tells me it'll take a half an hour. I said, okay. He starts the procedure. Two minutes later, he's in the waiting room looking at me. And I said, well, that was quick. He said, well, I have some news. And I'm like, I'm thinking he's going to tell me my husband's dead. Like, what other news? What other news could you tell me? Mm -hmm. I never fell to the ground so quickly. I said, tell me what is going on. He said, your husband's arteries are completely damaged. And now we have to do triple bypass surgery. That's not what you want to hear. Nope. And I thought to myself, what does that mean? Now, for the viewers, my husband's two years younger. He's a former Marine, so he takes care of his body. Like, what is happening? I literally, and I didn't want to tell anybody in my family because I didn't want them to do not help. I don't know what help I need. Do not, because if you come to help me, I have to help you and I have to worry about you. Leave right. me alone. I told nobody except mm. my dad. Why? Because he's 3,000 miles away. There's and he's not going to show up. Not showing up. When they did the surgery, I had no clue if my husband was going to be the same guy that I knew weeks before. And I have to tell you, I was scared out of my pants. After my husband's heart attack, I thought to myself, now I really want to be home. I want to see what happens on a daily basis in my house. I want to know what's the food he's eating or how's his health. I don't want to be told by a third party, hey, here's what happened. There's no mystery anymore. I am very involved in my husband's life, my children's life, my cousins. I call my cousins all the time. How are you? How you doing? Because you can't get that time back, you know? So that's, that's the health story. So because of that, I'm very careful of taking care of my health, what I eat, how I take care of my body, how I take care of my mind. One of the things that I mentioned to you when we did the first episode, New Year's Eve, I asked myself three questions, right? Mm -hmm. I ask myself those questions even more now, not just on New Year's Eve. Yeah. And for the listeners, it is a short 15 minute episode. I urge you to listen to that because as much as it was my first episode and I didn't know what I was doing, Pat definitely knew what she was. And she's always someone with a lot of wisdom. I've learned a lot from her. Like I said, she was my mentor. She's got me out of a lot of hot soup. And so the life lessons that you're going to hear today from her are going to be valuable. Pat, tell us, why did you tell us that story and what are the life lessons that come out of them? And once we do that, I want to know about the book because you didn't tell us about the book okay. in the beginning. So what I've learned in my life, be intentional. I am so intentional. I am so intentional with what I'm doing and where I'm going. Everything that I do, I'm just so much more intentional about it. And not just my dreams and my aspirations, but what time I wake up in the morning, what I'm going to cook in the afternoon, if I'm going to participate in this event with Hamida today. I'm very intentional about my time. I really, 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 really am to the point where I'm so sensitive that I don't want to waste other people's time. It, you can't do it either way. The other thing that I've learned is I have spent the better part of the last maybe two and a half years making sure that I stay so connected to my uncles and my aunts and my cousins and my nieces because when I grew up, we lived in the same 200 family tenement. Today, it's a struggle for my kids to know who their cousins are. And yet we have all this technology. So I, I, they make fun of me, but I create these little Zoom meetings. Hey, Auntie Pat's calling for 15 minutes. Everybody's got to get on the call. Hey, what are you doing? What do you know? Because my family's so big, there's got to be people in it that can help other people that are in it. Mm -hmm. So I want to teach my younger relatives how to get the rhythm of keeping in touch. And they love it, but somehow they needed that kick in the butt to do it. They don't have what I had. My cousins are not just down the hall. My kids' cousins and their relatives are hours away. You got to get on a plane. It's a different time zone. They're in the military and all this other stuff. The other thing I learned is I don't apologize to myself anymore. I am who I am. And if you don't like it, that is not my problem. Because when I worked in business, sometimes you had to assimilate. Sometimes you had to not act a different way, but you know when you were not being yourself, when you were operating in a way that was just not your normal state because you wanted to get that promotion. You wanted to get on that project. You wanted to get that, that grade, if you will. But I have to tell the viewers, you got to like yourself. So be as authentic as possible. And if somebody in your space doesn't value that and like that is not your problem. Sometimes people spend too much time to get other people to like them. I don't care if you don't like me, but you have to respect me. Pat, are you saying that looking back, you feel you did that yeah. when you were in the corporate space? Yeah. And do you regret doing that? And are you telling the viewers that it really doesn't matter what your goal is? They always should 
become authentically as themselves. You have to. And I did that more in my in the early part of my career because I thought that's what I had to do. You kind of get caught up into the culture and the ecosystem of the company you work for. And you just say, okay, that's how it works. And especially if you're a woman, you want to be liked. So you say, okay, that's how it works. I'll do it this way. I'll, I'll, I don't want to be not liked, so I'll, let me just do it this way. And the next thing you know, three, four, five, six, seven years have passed. And you know that you would not normally do that in an environment where there was not any of that clutter or that those impressions that you had to appeal to. In your family, you wouldn't do that. In your own friends, you wouldn't do that. But somehow when you get dropped into these ecosystems, you were, you know, okay, you know what? I guess I have to do that. And you know you're doing it. And then you have to say, don't they want me for me? And I think sometimes we get tripped up on being liked and being wanted versus being ourselves. Later on in my career, I got more confidence. Yeah, I was going to say that you had a very successful career. Are you saying that looking back, if you had always shown up authentically, you would still have the same successful career and that you didn't need to do what you did? I think I would have been more successful, mm. faster. I think I would have been successful sooner. I really do. I think my assimilation cost me maybe five years in my career. I really do. Because I knew how hard I worked. But I always felt that I had to do this one extra thing just to appease this person. Not because they told me that they had to, but I put this barrier, I put this film up, I put this thing up. You get caught up in the environment and you create these own fabricated reasons why you have to do these things. Yeah. So I never tried just being me and see what happens until it was later in my career when I had the seniority and no one dared tell me what to do, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm the, to me, I'm like, wait, I'm the same person. How is it that I created this fence? So like when a young woman would come into my office and say, what are some of the barriers? Or they would say to me, well, how hard was it? What do you mean? Why, why did you think it was hard? It's easy, but you make it hard because you think it's hard. And I would say to them, unless you can give me the example where somebody actually put up a barrier in front of you and you could show that to me, you're putting up the barrier. It's very, very hard for people to hear that. But that's how I would, if I had to go back, I would have been a little more judgmental, a little more confident, a little less nice and appealing mm -hmm. and thankful and servant-like. And but apologetic. I apologetic. I would apologize for everything. Oh, I'm sorry I'm late. I'm sorry to get you that report. I'm not really sorry. I just didn't get it for you. I'll do it when I get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I sorry? Why do you have to be sorry? There was something that I read that says, don't be sorry, be thankful. So when you're late, don't say, I'm sorry, I'm late. Say, thank you for waiting for me. Exactly. Because you're putting that brand on you. Whenever you say that, you are now the sorry person. You, you, so words matter, right? So when I talk about being deliberate and intentional, it's all, you have to be so strategic, especially if you're in an ecosystem of a company. You have to really be very strategic in how you even brand yourself. Because if you keep, I'm late, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, that's Hamida. She's always apologizing. Yeah. Really? You think you're going to get promoted because you're the one who apologizes? That means that you don't have any strength. You don't have conviction. And if you had to work with the client, they could bully you over in a heartbeat. They want to make sure that people in these companies are high performing. They have confidence in themselves because they know things are going to go wrong. Can you handle it? Mm -hmm. Can you handle it? We know we can, but somehow we don't get as fortified in these environments for whatever reason. And I, sometimes I think we do it to ourselves. We could be our worst enemy. Here, another life lesson in, in what you just said. Things will always go wrong. Always go wrong. You can count on it. You know how they say change is constant? Uh-huh. I'm like, change is inevitable. It is inevitable. Things are going to change. So always be ready, which is another part of the thing in my book. So you don't have to get ready. And what does that mean? That just always be ready. Like women who are having babies, they have their go bag. They are ready from the time they get pregnant. They are ready. Oh, I'm out. Are you ready with your life that way? Mm -hmm. If something is due next week, are you going to start it the day before next week? Like everybody knows how long it takes them to do something. They really do. Yeah. Sometimes people work fast. But I can't tell you how fast you have to work. You know it. So always be ready, which means you have to be more aware of what's happening around you. You should not be surprised. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then you're like in reaction mode. And you know me. Another thing in the book, the best defense is a good offense. If I always have to react to change, I'm literally just reacting to change. I'm not improving. I'm not learning. I'm not getting my groove on. I'm just like playing a video game, just trying to get out of my way. How about I get ahead of it? Mm-hmm. How about I take the time and say, you know what, let me plan out my day a little better here. Let me get ahead of this. Pat, stay there because I also want to add some hows to this. Mm -hmm. Get ahead is the what. 
Yeah. Yeah. You just started telling us the house, plan okay. your day. What okay. else can we so, do to get ahead of it? That's right. So what I do every night, even though I'm not working, I still have a day of things that I have to get done. So every night before I go to bed, what I do, everything on my calendar gets done. That's how I keep myself in order. And so I look at my calendar last night. It's okay, fine. At 7.30, I wake up for mass. I got to go to mass this morning. And then when I get home, I have to call my cousin. If I think about what that means with my cousin, that's about a half an hour. I know I have Hamida at two. So I set it in my watch at 1.45, get ready for Hamida. Like I put things in there so I know what my day. And then I could say, you know what? I have free time between A and B. So I'm ready for the day. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I'm not going to do is check my mail because whatever's in my mail, it's someone else's homework. I already have my day plan. Do not intercept. Do not get in my way. Yeah. I will deal with you after I am confident that my list gets done. How often do you go to work in the morning? You get your cup of coffee. And the first thing you do is you turn on your computer. The minute you turn on that computer and you see all those mails coming, you literally get stuck on the computer and you're just replying to people's messages and reply to their messages. The next thing you know, you haven't had lunch. Five o'clock comes and then... When all your homework for those people are done, then you start the do yours. And guess what you do? You complain that the day got behind you. Well, whose fault was that? It was your time. I'm very, very careful by time. That doesn't mean I don't know how to operate if someone says I need your help. You need my help, Amita? Two o'clock, because right now I got something I'm finishing. Yeah. So I, I tell the listeners, if you're still employed, you want flexibility, you want to be on a project, you want to raise, you want whatever you want. If you're going to use your energy and your oxygen to tell somebody, here's what you want, and you have convinced yourself that that's what you want, and they give it to you, you have to take it. Mm -hmm. Or if you want something, you have to do it. If you say something, you have to mean it. The first question I always ask people, you want me to go to a meeting? Do you really need me there, or do you need an answer from me right now? Do you need this report, or do you need a number on page 16? Nine out of 10 times, people ask for stuff, but they really don't know what they were asking for. Mm -hmm. You need to manage and say, Okay, Hamida, I know you asked for the report, but tell me what you're trying to do. Because if I had that in my head, then the report's not really what you need. Here's the number that you're looking for. Okay, thank you. So don't just let people pull you into their noise. I hear you, but the okay. message is lost. So I want to understand exactly what you're okay. saying. Uh, so if someone is asking you for something, are you saying follow up? No. So let me just be clear. If anybody asks for something, not only in the company, but in your life, mm -hmm. anybody, your sister, your brother, your neighbor, and says, hey, can you do this? Can I have that? The first question I ask is, okay, but tell me what you're trying to do. What is your end game? Mm. Because I might have a better way. I might have a better thing. Don't just fall into responding. Don't just be on the lazy Susan of life. Mm. And I'm not saying we should challenge people because I don't want it to be like you're debating and fighting. But take a moment to just ask, what is their end game? Yeah. Because then I can respond. I say, oh, that's what you want to do? You know what? Here's a better challenge. Here's a better answer. And maybe I'm not the right person. Maybe you should speak to Susie. But if you just respond, what you're creating is this tail where they'll find out that they need more and more and more and more. And you've already got sucked into their list of things and now you become their to do. No. Yeah. There's something in the book. It says, uh, don't go to work to work. Go there to network. Which means, I would say to people, try to get, whatever you were expected to do done as quickly as possible so you have more time to think, to talk, develop relationships. Don't get caught up with just doing the physical part of the job. That's not how you grow. Very true. Right? Yeah. Pat, tell us about the book. I want to know about mm -hmm. the book. And then after that, I have a question to ask you. The book is my straight shooting answer is to 30 years of career questions people have asked me because it's literally 30 years. And I called it the history of Davidism. Every single thing in this book is a real story, is a real example that I've given to people. I made this name out because I remember I was at, I think it was at Sullivan Brothers at the time. I was in technology. Mm -hmm. There was a gentleman that worked for me. And I would always say something like, be where the ball is going to be. Or eat from a fat cook. I would say something that was appropriate for whatever was happening in the company. It could be at a meeting. It could be in an email. And I would say these one-liners. I said it with a joke. I said it with a quip. I said it quickly. It was memorable enough for them to keep that tool in the toolkit and reuse it when they needed it. Mm -hmm. And so this gentleman said, oh, there goes another Davidism. Now, this was 30 years ago. He coined this term. It's basically 30 years of things that I've said. Yeah. And I'm not an expert in what I say, but I'm very honest in what I say. I urge the listeners to read this book. 
Pat, you said you have a discount code for the listeners. Can I, I do. put that in the show I, notes? Yes, you can. They can get Audible on Amazon. They can get it on Kindle. They can buy the paperback. But if they go to my website, it's going to be patricia-david.com. You can order the book from that website and you put in spring 15 and you'll get a 15% discount. This will be in the show notes, everyone. So you don't have to write this down. You don't have to take notes. I will do that for you. And Pat, as your final message to the listeners, tell us what you think is the best advice that you have given in that book. Have a plan. That was the same advice that you gave yes. in episode number one. Have yes. a plan. Have a plan. And then I tell people, plan the work and then work the plan. Mm -hmm. You don't just want to have a plan that says, my plan is to buy a house. Okay. My question to you is if you're honest with yourself and that's what you said you wanted, then show me where the actions are on that plan that's going to make that happen. And until you do, it's just a piece of paper with words on it. And I think that's where we need to be a little more deliberate and intentional with, are you willing to put in whatever the work, the time, the energy, the financials that are in to get, if not, scratch that off and come up with a plan that you will implement. I would urge everybody, you have to have a plan and the plans change over time. As we know. Plan with milestones, check in with yes. yourself every time the milestone shows up and see where you are against your plan. Of course, as you said, that's not always that you'll be at the place where you want to be. There may be times that you won't. And then what? You keep planning, right? Yeah. Right. I, it's called life. And I, I am so in tune with my life. I don't want it to be leading me. I want to lead my life. I want to lead my life. I just want to lead my life. And so if I get stuck in a place that I don't like, I can't blame anybody but me. That's great advice. And it still works. It worked in 2019. Yeah. It's still your best advice in 2022. Best advice. And I wish I could, I wish I could go and put my hands into the screen and hug you, Hamida. I just love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> me too, Pat. Me too. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for starting me off on this journey. It was my goal. I know I'm going to get to 100. I don't know what I'm going to do after that. But thank you for also being part of the 10th season of Sharing Life Lessons. Much love to you and all your viewers. I just continue to wish you all the joy that you deserve from me. Thank you very much, sweetie. Thank you. Love you, Pat. Right. Take right care. Then. Bye bye. Listeners, Pat has over 30 years of experience and success. I can tell you that she is a person who walks her talk. So everything that she said in this dialogue and that she has written in her book is what has led to her success. As always, here are my key takeaways from this discussion. One, Time is precious. You can't get back time. So make your choices about how you use your time. Be intentional with what you're doing, where you're going, who you are keeping relationships with. Don't get sucked into things you don't wish to do. You are free to choose how you use the precious, limited, and unpredictable time you have left on earth. 2. Maintain the relationship with your loved ones. And if you are a parent, do it more so that you can role model that behavior to your children. Three, stop apologizing for yourself. Be as authentic as possible. Sometimes people spend too much time and energy to get other people to like them. Pat told us that she fell into that trap too and that her pleasing others attitude cost her five years of her career. If she had shown up authentically earlier, she would be successful sooner. Listeners, this is what Sharing Life Lessons' purpose is. It is to learn from others who are willing to share so that you don't have to waste your five years. Others have already done the work for us and taken the pain so that it gets simpler for us. Let's capitalize on this knowledge. Four, things will go wrong. They always do. Thus, always be ready. If not, we will be in a consistently reactionary mode. We won't learn, we won't grow, and we won't be able to use the changes as opportunities because we will be busy reacting to changes. Five, don't let people pull you into their noise. Understand what their end game is because you may have something better to give them for their purpose than what they're asking from you. And lastly, have a plan. Plan to work and then work the plan. This brings us to the end of this episode. I will bring you the hundredth, oh, I'm going to say that again. I will bring you the hundredth episode of Sharing Life Lessons in two weeks. Until then, be happy, be safe, 
and be blessed.